Greetings and welcome to the Cresham Valley Church worship service for August 2nd, 2020. We begin our worship service with a meditation. This comes from Martin Luther. The great Protestant reformer wrote this, Our works do not generate righteousness. Rather, our righteousness in Christ generates works. Jesus once said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I long to gather you as a hen gathers its chicks, but you were not willing. You will not see me again, Jerusalem, until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Who comes in the name of the Lord? Now arise, O Lord, come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Then we will rejoice as we're clothed with your righteousness and celebrate the love Baruch haba b'shem Adonai Blessed is he and celebrate the love Baruch haba b'shem Adonai Blessed is he who comes Baruch Amen. That was wonderful. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Well, I'm David Veeman. I am the associate pastor here at Crescent Valley Church, and we do have a few announcements. Um, just want to let you know we are having what we're calling a bonus uh, summer Sunday school series. It's going to be led by uh, Jonathan Richardson, and it's based on it's uh, based on our union with Christ. It's titled. Union with Jesus means communion with one another. 
It'll be held on August 9th, 16th, and 23rd. So look for more information coming out and links to that Sunday school. We also want to remind you that every Friday morning, starting at 7.30 a.m., we do have a Friday morning devotional. This is a 45-minute time of inspiration, fellowship, and prayer with one another, starting on reflection on a passage of Scripture. We have a number, another uh, other messages and announcements later on in your order of worship. You can refer to that. But we do want to remind you, if you have any needs, or whether material or spiritual, that are pressing at this time, please contact John Leiter and myself or one of the elders so we can see how we can help you. With that, let us take a minute or two just to quiet our hearts before the Lord. So as our call to worship, we're going to read uh, from Psalm 16. And David said, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, uh, this Sunday in particular, we celebrate your Son, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son in whom you are well pleased. The one who it says, blessed is the name of him who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, we uh, especially worship him and celebrate him because of Jesus Christ's righteousness. That he has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And therefore has bought peace with us and you. And Lord, and has brought us into this fellowship we now have with you, with one another. That is made known to us by your Holy Spirit, which is spread apart in our hearts. And Lord, we know that you have uh, done this for us because Jesus was, has been raised from the dead. And as the Apostle Peter pointed out, that you would not abandon his soul to Sheol. You would not allow your Holy One to see corruption, but you raised him on the third day. So Lord, we thank you and praise you for this as we come now into your courts with praise. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. So let's continue our worship by singing this wonderful hymn number 457, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, the words to the and the music can be found later on in your order of worship.
We come now to our confession of faith in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed uh, teaches us a number of things, but the heart of the Creed is about the work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let us confess together our faith in God and in his Holy Son and the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence shall he come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we'll have a reading from the Old Testament uh, by Christy Leonard. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Please read along with me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of the Lord. When we come before our God, we realize we come before a holy God. And it should bring us to a sense of our own sinfulness and our sin. So with that, let us confess our sins together with the confession that's found in your altar of worship. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offenses, we pray, and make us clean, that we may live as members of Christ, in whom alone is life, in whom alone is salvation and eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let us silently confess our sins to the Lord. Hear now the promise of pardon from our Lord. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Amen. Well, it's time now for to sing our next hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, a great hymn for times of trouble like the one we're going through now. Death. 
Come now to our time of prayer. I ask you to join with me in this prayer, labor together. The Lord said where two or three are gathered, even though we're not physically present, but we are certainly together here in spirit. You are there also. And uh, God wants us to come to him in prayer and ask him for the things we need. So let us come now before God, our Father. Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just got done singing this wonderful hymn. And Lord, we, we, could, we wish we could say it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. So we look around us, um, things just don't seem to get better. Uh, we've gone through week after week and hoping that uh, this pandemic would leave us. And now we're coming to the realization that it won't, um, that we'll have to be living in these strange, unusual circumstances for a long time. And some, unfortunately, will die. Our economy will be in tatters. And while many of us are, are doing fine, we know that many of our countrymen and also those around the world will be hurting uh, grievously. Lord, this is a tough time. But as Lord, as this uh, uh, hymn has taught us, you are with us, but even more, the, you have taught us the, the heart of the gospel. We know that you love us because of Christ's death for us and his resurrection, because of the Holy Spirit you have put into our heart because of your power that you give us to continue on, even though we're buffeted, even though we go through tough times, we go through sorrows, and uh, we do go through sorrows. We know that we will lose our, some of our loved ones, and we know that we ourselves, at the end, will suffer as we face death. But Lord, we, we have this hope. We know that as you did not suffer Jesus, uh, to have his to suffer uh, corruption, you did not leave his soul and show all what you raised him up from the dead. Lord, we know that with, we are with him. You will also raise us up together with him at the last day. And that then when we breathe our last breath, we who are now alive with you in Jesus Christ will, be, will be, see you. We will be with you in paradise that day. Lord, these are good things. Lord, these are the things that help us through this time. And we thank you and we praise you for this. And we give you all honor and glory and power and praise. But Lord, we even know now that um, 
you have answered prayer. Uh, as we've gone through this particular time of being sequestered in our homes, we've had maybe more times of prayer. And Lord, we, we can count up the answers you've, you've given us to our prayers. We thank you that you have kept our, our CVC community safe from this pandemic, that you have held most of us up financially. Well, we thank you for that. And Lord, we even now have another, heard another answer to prayer that Chris Middleton has now gotten her her uh, eyesight back and she's now out of it. She's out of care and she's now in a in a more rehab place and is uh, and is recovering. Lord, we thank you for that answer to prayer and uh, to so many things. And Lord, we lift up um, those who are other, still hurting, those who are going through, have chronic illnesses. Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for um, Diana Frazier's brother, who seems to be doing well uh, with his cancer treatment. So we ask that you would continue uh, to help him. We think of many others in our congregation who, in addition to the strange time, have to also bear chronic illnesses, and we pray that you would bear them up. Uh, we pray that you would be with the Brooks family as they uh, mourn the loss of Jamila's uh, grandfather. And Lord, we also ask that you would, at this time, uh, be with those who are going through transitions or are moving. We pray for Megan and Peter Yui as they are now down in South Carolina. Help them to connect well. Help them to um, get on board with their new life. Help them to find a church there where they can uh, fellowship with other believers and be spiritually sustained and refreshed. Lord, we pray for uh, the, fr the Fries, Kimberly and David and the children as they are moving out um, into the western suburbs. Uh, Lord, be with them. Help them to make all the arrangements and be with them. Uh, Lord, we also pray for the Brooks as they finally uh, look like they're about ready to get into their new housing at the University of Pennsylvania. And especially, in, and Jamila will take on a new role where she'll be able, and, and I assume Lindsay will be able to interact with students. Lord, we pray that you would make that go smoothly and that you would just open up doors so that they would be able to enter into people's lives there. Uh, and be able to spread the gospel. Lord, we pray the same thing for all of us. Uh, even though we're, we're cloistered, um, we think about the Apostle Paul when he wrote the letter to the Philippians and how he was in chains, and yet he still saw the gospel going out. The, the, the palace guard was hearing the gospel, and they were becoming converted. People were hearing about the testimony. So, Lord, we pray that in our own lives, poor little us who we don't, we don't think much of ourselves, that you would nonetheless... Give us, use us to, to, um, to bring the gospel into others' lives. Also make the gospel real and powerful in our own lives at this time. Instruct us, guide us, encourage us, correct us, rebuke us where we need to be rebuked so that we can live lives of righteousness that please you. Uh, not because of our own ability to do that, but because Christ who has gone before us and who has sent the Holy Spirit into our lives. And Lord, we, we all have this heavy on our hearts, just where our nation is at this time. We are down. We seem to have lost our way. So Lord, we, we pray as you have, have commanded us to, to pray for our leaders. And we pray that you would guide them. That maybe despite um, what may be very bad motivations, you would nonetheless work through them. Um, for the good of your people in particular, but also for the good of those around us, those who we love, those who we hope to be able to share the gospel too, that you would uh, work all this and for them. You would bring your common grace to them as well as your special grace to us. So Lord, we pray that you would continue to bear us up at this time, uh, especially those who are isolated and, and living alone. And Lord, I also pray a special prayer for the teenagers who at this time are missing so much of, uh, of the fun socialness that is part of adolescence. Lord, uh, pray that you would help them. Help them find other ways of uh, being able to connect with people and being a part of things. So, Lord, we lift up all these uh, prayers and requests to you uh, with great praise and thankfulness uh, for what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. And through him we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, why don't you stand up, uh, shake your legs a little bit as we praise God by singing the doxology.
Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome to our live stream. My name, John, my name is John Leonard. I'm one of the pastors here at Crescent Valley Church. Thank you for joining us this morning as we worship God in spirit and in truth. We pray that you will be encouraged by all that has taken place. The reading of scripture, the prayers, and the music will encourage you and give you the spiritual strength you need to face whatever you're facing this week. We are in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in chapter 5, verse 20. And um, we are in entitling our series in Matthew, The King and His Kingdom. We are in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus is giving his inaugural address to his disciples. He's telling us how we are to impact the broken world in which we live. Now, most people think that the Sermon on the Mount is a, a great treatise on social behavior, on morals, uh, and it is that, but it's quite shocking. A couple weeks ago, we looked at a, a shocking passage where Jesus said, rejoice and, and uh, be glad for when you're persecuted, for they, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But our verse this morning is even, even more shocking. So let's hear from the Word of God, Matthew chapter 5. Verse 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. Matthew 5, 20 may not sound all that shocking to us because most of what we know about the Pharisees, we've learned from the teachings of Jesus, and Jesus was pretty hard on the Pharisees. In, as you read the Gospels, <laughs> The tax gatherers and sinners are seen in a better light than the Pharisees themselves. And so we're thinking, well, you know, most people's righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees because they just weren't very nice people. But that's not how they were viewed at that time, particularly by themselves. The Pharisees were the gold standards of righteousness. The Pharisees to righteousness were as... Hussein Bolt is to the 100-yard dash, it, what Mike Trout is to baseball, and what Royal Mac, Roy Mackle, <laughs> sorry, my Scottish isn't that good, <laughs> Roy McElroy is in golf. In other words, they were the very best in the world at what they do. And the Pharisees were seen and saw themselves in just that way. Jesus certainly got the attention of his disciples when he told them, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. But once the disciples got over the shock of that, those words and the question that you've probably asked when you heard these words, the same one that the disciples were asking is, well, how much more must our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? How much more? We want to know just exactly what's re required of us. But when we think that way about the law of God, what we're doing is we're falling into exactly the way that the Pharisees looked at God's law. They were always wanting to know just how much is demanded of me so I'll know when I can stop. So I will know uh, when I don't have to put out any more effort. This was behind a lot of the questions that Jesus was asked by the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyer. You remember the lawyer that came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the law and you tell me. And the lawyer said, well, you've got to love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus said, do that and you'll live. And the lawyer, it says, seeking to justify himself, seeking to find out where his obligations to his fellow man stopped, he said, who is my brother? Now, this attitude of how much is enough, it was even a part of Jesus' disciples' thinking, particularly Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. Do you remember when Peter asked, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? As much as seven times? What he wanted to know is, Lord, now can I exact my revenge? Seven times he's done it. I can uh, get what I, I want out of him for all those things he's done to me. When I was teaching at Westminster Theological Seminary, the first day of class when we passed out the syllabus, there would always be 
serious questions about the, uh, about the requirements of the syllabus. And, and never one of those questions was, you know, what, what more can I do to make sure I'm mastering this material? It was always, uh, do, do, do we really have to do all of these things that you're asking us here to do? And, and to what level do we have to do those things? Ladies, you might remember if you're married, your, your wedding day when the, your husband made those vows, when he promised to love, honor, and to cherish. Uh, he didn't say, I'll love you in the most convenient and the, 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 the way that's least uh, difficult for me and easiest for me to do. He didn't say that. Now, you may think that's what he meant, <laughs> having lived with him all those years since, but no, that's, that's not what, what um, he meant. When I was a, a boy, we had to play the piano. Scott, you might be interested in this story. And so every morning, I had my half hour of piano practice before I went to school. And about every five minutes, I'd always say, how much more? How much more? Why? Because I, I wanted it to come to an end. And that the, the, the problem with this how much more mentality of the law leads us right into uh, the Pharisees' understanding of righteousness. Because you see, the Pharisees wanted to see the commandments of God as a stop sign. They wanted to get there and say, okay, I've made it. It's enough. Or as a checklist that you can check these things off and, and move beyond them. The more righteousness that Jesus is speaking of is an attitude that doesn't see God's law as a stop sign, but as a signpost. Now, what's the difference between a stop sign and a signpost? Well, at a stop sign, you, you quit. At a signpost, it might be an arrow, it might be a mile marker, or uh, how many miles to the, the next city. It tells you how far you have to go. It, it encourages you, it guides you, it, it leads you on. And this is what we want to, uh, how we want to see the law of God. In fact, this is the very way that Jesus interprets it in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount and also in the Gospels. In just a few weeks, we'll be looking at these commands that Jesus reinterprets in the Gospels. And he says, the fact that you haven't murdered anyone isn't enough. You have to not be angry with your brother. And then he goes on to say, and it's not even enough not to be angry with your brother. Uh, you can't call him a fool. He'll go on to say, it's not enough to, to have not committed adultery you must also be pure in your thought life and, and, um, and, and not allow that to, to uh, be a distraction. He says to the lawyer when he says, who is my neighbor? He doesn't say, well, you know, that three houses down is enough. Or the person in the next zip code is not your neighbor. Or, you know, if you cross Stinton Avenue into Montgomery County, uh, they're not your neighbors out there. Uh, he told them the parable of the Good Samaritan. When Peter asked, is seven times enough? Jesus said to him, no, it's 70 times seven. Now, if you're thinking, okay, Lord, then my, my brother who's offended me has 483 times left before he gets his. That's not what Jesus was trying to communicate. We don't ask the how much more question when it comes to Jesus because we see the law in an entirely different way, not as a stop sign, but a signpost, a signpost that encourages us, us to, to go on a signpost that, that pushes us towards that destination. And what is it that the law of God points us to or leads us to? It points us to God himself. It points us to the nature and character of our Heavenly Father because uh, these are concrete examples of what the qualities and character of our God and his attributes look like as they're lived out in life. And we see this in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. And in the Old Testament, the people of Israel to be holy because God is holy. In the same way, we as New Testament believers are to reflect the nature and character of our God. We're to be holy as he is holy. And Jesus will say this in the Sermon on the Mount. The most shocking verse in all the Sermon on the Mount is found in chapter 5. Verse 48, where Jesus says, you must be perfect even as your heavenly Father in, uh, is perfect. The righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees is one that does not ask, how little can I do to meet the requirements, but sees the law of God as a signpost, a motivation that pushes us on to reflect more accurately the nature and character of our God. Secondly, 
our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees because our righteousness isn't confined to religious activity. We don't see the Pharisees doing anything in the Gospels but religious activity. Even when they invite Jesus over to their house for a meal like Simon, uh, he's judging Jesus and all his behavior based upon his religious activity. Why do we think that religious activity somehow counts double as it's some type of special activity in life? That's not the kind of righteousness that our Lord is talking about. And often we think that the way we are religious is by avoiding secular activity. That's how the Pharisees thought. But the righteousness that exceeds out of the scribes and the Pharisees is to bring the principles in God's law to every activity in our life. It's to look at life as a continuation of a way of worshiping God where there's no division between holy and secular. Between this part of my life is lived for God and this part of my life is lived for me. No, it's seeing all of life as belonging to God and serving Him in all of life. The righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees isn't a righteousness that confines exclusively to religious activity but spills over in all of life. Third, the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees majors on the majors. Now, this is important because the Pharisees were great at majoring on the minors. You remember Jesus' woe to them in chapter 23, verse 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe the mint, the dill, and the cumin, very small spices, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, I can tell you that I specialize in putting off the important things by doing the minutia. I get up in the morning, I have uh, a sermon to write, and I realize, well, I should really check my email, and I have to answer uh, these people. They're very important uh, questions that need to be answered. And then I'll say, well, you know, I maybe should uh, arrange my desk here and get things in order so I, I won't be distracted when I, I go to write my sermon. And then I figure, well, maybe I should go down and get a snack to help me concentrate, get my blood sugar up, get my brain going. And before I know it, the whole morning has gone and it's time for lunch. Why? Because I have, I have not majored on the majors. I filled my time with all the minutia in life. Now, there was a philosophy in the second half of the 20th century known as existentialism. And uh, existentialist authors uh, would write about people who had to make choices between the minutia in their life or the, this major challenge that lay before them. And, it, and, it, and, and if you read the existentialist writers, they're always playing off these, these kind of meaningless activities that someone is doing versus this, this major challenge that is confronting them. Well, there's some truth in that. You know, we have to decide, are we going to fill our lives with minutia? Are we going to live for what's important? Are, are, are we going to... Uh, are, we, are we going to uh, do those things uh, that God requires of us? The, the, this righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the that exceeds the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is a righteousness that majors on the majors. Fourth, a righteousness that exceeds righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is a righteousness that re re resembles an iceberg. Resembles an iceberg. And that is that most of our righteousness should kind of be below the surface. There's a depth to those who are truly righteous that if you keep exploring, you'll just find how profound it is. Where the Pharisees, it was the other way around. You know, only you can only see 10% of an iceberg. Young people, if you want to explore this, you can. You don't have to go to the North Atlantic. Just simply drop an ice cube in a in a uh, glass of water, and you can see that just a small part will be above the water. Uh, but it, those big icebergs, only a small part is above the water, 
but for the Pharisees, they reversed that. Most of their righteousness was publicly portrayed. They wanted people to see it. They wanted people to see it. That's why they gave um, when they in such a way that people drew attention to themselves with the sounding of trumpet. They prayed on the street corners and they uh, prayed standing in the synagogue, and, and they wanted to uh, show off their righteousness because the reason they were doing it was for themselves, and they wanted to be honored and seen for that. But the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is a righteousness that's done for the sake and glory of Christ. It's kind of like a secret, like a secret between two lovers that uh, they don't want to let the world in on, but everyone watching uh, those two lovers know that uh, there's deep intimacy there. And Jesus will warn us not to be like the Pharisees in the way we demonstrate our righteousness. We don't practice righteousness for public eyes. We practice righteousness for uh, God alone. Fifth, the more righteousness is different from the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees because it has a different origin. It has a different origin. You see, the righteousness of the Pharisees comes from self-effort. Remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax gatherer who went up to the temple to pray? You know how the, the, the Pharisee was standing in the middle of the temple and he held up his hands and he, and he prayed this. He said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have and all that I get. What was the most common word, the most repeated word in his prayer? It was I. It was me. You see, it was all about him. And the problem with self-effort righteousness is that it's self-defeating. Righteousness that's done in your own power does not lead to godliness, but it leads to godlessness. And all you have to do is look at the attitudes of the Pharisees and see that they're not becoming more like Christ in their effort to keep the law. They're not becoming more like the God of Israel, holy, that they're holy. They're, they're filled with all kinds of other very negative attitudes. Self-righteousness results in pride, self-centeredness, lack of compassion, a judgmental spirit. And this is the kind of righteousness that always defaults to external actions. Because why? Because you don't want to deal with those hard truths about yourself. You don't want to have to look on the inside and say, you know, there's some not very good stuff going on in here. And that's why it's so easy for us to, to swallow camels and choke over gnats because it's uh, self-effort righteousness. What is the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, it's a righteousness that comes as a gift by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, no one knew the difference between these two kinds of righteousness than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. The Apostle Paul excelled in self-effort righteousness. And he has this great autobiographical passage in Philippians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles open, you might want to turn there with me. And in this uh, description, he describes this self-effort of righteousness that he spends his life producing. In verse 9, it says, um, you know, he excelled in, in self-righteousness, but until he, he came, until, that would, uh, until he found the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ, a righteousness that depends on God. Now, now Paul was the kind of person who excelled in self-effort self righteousness. Listen to what he says in verses 4 and 6. He says, I myself have reason for confidence. That's a good word for pride in the flesh. The flesh is self-effort righteousness. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I far more. Then he talks about all the things that he's accumulated, this list of things where he, where he holds out as self-effort righteousness. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He's of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrew, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He had it all when it came to self-effort righteousness. Listen to how he describes himself in Galatians 1.14. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous 
was I for the traditions of my father. Paul was an excellent law keeper. He excelled at it. And what did it produce in Paul? A zealot. A zealot who persecuted, arrested, imprisoned, and murdered Christians. And it was all justified in his mind by his self-effort righteousness. There's no more dangerous kinds of sin than religious sin that's justified through self-effort righteousness. Then Paul met Jesus. Do you know what the largest barrier for self-effort righteousness people is to the gospel? It's that righteousness. Because they've spent a lifetime pouring themselves into this mold to try to be and win God's approval on their own. But it's of no value to them. Paul's eyes were literally open, and he could see another kind of righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. What Paul immediately realized was that there was no comparison between the righteousness that was based on works and the righteousness that rested on the work of Christ. You see, Isaiah called his righteousness and the people's righteousness in the Old Testament, filthy rags. Paul upset one better in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, my own righteousness is like garbage. It has, it's worthless. It's of no value. And the reason that he could understand that his righteousness had no value is because he saw the surpassing righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when you see Jesus for who he is, the first response is you see yourself for who you are. That's what happened to Peter, didn't it, on the boat when he was fishing. He had that great catch of fish. And as a fisherman, I know if there's a great catch of fish, if Jesus were in the boat, I'd say, Jesus, would you get the net and help me get that one in? But what does Peter do? He falls down on his knees and he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinner. Uh, when you see Jesus, you understand uh, who you are. Uh, you understand that his righteousness surpasses any righteousness that you have. One of my jobs during the uh, COVID lockdown is doing a little painting of the trim. Now, I always thought the trim in our house was white. And it's easy to think that most white paints are white until you go to the paint store and ask for white. And then you realize that White is a pretty wide scale. And what you do when you see the righteousness of Christ, you see that I'm not even on the scale. This is true righteousness. And this is what, this is what uh, Paul saw. When you embrace Christ, notice Paul doesn't embrace the righteousness of Christ. He embraces Christ. When you embrace Christ, all that is his becomes yours. Now, unfortunately, most believers' growth are stifled because they only understand part of the work of Christ on their behalf. When I was growing up, I remember that almost every message had to do with the death of Christ and him paying for my sin. And I wondered, is that all there is to the gospel? Yes, Jesus paid for my sin. That's wonderful. I'm free from my sin. And, and then I finally got this idea, well, then I guess it's up to me to work and stay out of sin so that I might please my God and Heavenly Father. The problem is, is that I was asked to come to faith by grace, and then I was asked to live the Christian life by works. The very thing I was to renounce in coming to Christ, trusting in my own righteousness, I then turned around and trusted in, in maintaining my faith in Christ. The truth of the gospel is this, is that Christ not only died for our sins, but he lived a perfect life. He's now uh, ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. He's perfectly righteous. And that righteousness is ours because he has won it for us. Notice the fruit of this righteousness in the life of Paul. And this is the same fruit that you can expect in your own life. First of all, no longer did Paul suffer from the Let's try to get away with as little as possible when it came to keeping the law. 
Listen to how Paul describes his life as a Christian. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. Does that sound like someone who wants to stop? <laughs> hey, young people, you got somebody you're interested in? You got someone you really like to get to know, somebody who, who you know you hope that once this is over, you could somehow maybe date? Are you kind of trying to say, well, I'll, I'll do as little as possible to get to know this person? Are you, or do you want to give your whole self completely to them? Paul is saying that I might know Christ. Verse 12, he says, I press on. And the image here is that last few meters in the marathon. You know how that is, Scott? You know, do you, do you slow down or do you give it every last bit of it? You, you give it that every last bit that you have. And then look what Paul says in chapter th uh, 3, verse 13 and 14. Forgetting what lies behind and straining Forward to Eliza head, I press on towards a goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Know that true righteousness doesn't leave you with this attitude of how little can I get away with. Secondly, the righteousness that Paul received by faith is a righteousness that spilled over into every area of Paul's life, even the most mundane things. You know, Paul makes this statement, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. Do you, are you conscious of that when you sit down to eat or to drink? These things that, that we do multiple times a day, you're doing it for the glory of God. Paul is saying that, that his life, every part of it is spilled over in the service to God and becomes religious devotion and worship and most of all, the most important things. Uh, there's no part of Paul's life and that righteousness doesn't spill over into. Third, the righteousness that comes from a faith in Christ caused Paul to major on that what, what is most important. Listen again to that passage in Philippians 3. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 14. I press on towards a goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Young people, you want to know what's important in life? You want to know what real life is? Then you make those goals your goals in life. Over every other goal, you write those goals and you'll live life to the fullest and you'll live life for Christ. Fourth, the righteousness that Paul received by faith caused him to focus on Christ and not to be concerned about what others thought of him. We're all victims of crowd think. I uh, don't believe me. Just think about what you don't say on Facebook and what you do say. You know, you don't you don't want people to think poorly of you. What can free us from that inertia of what other people think of me? A vision of Christ, a relationship with Christ, causes that to fall off like dross. In Philippians 3, we learn that Paul has a consuming vision of Christ. And that makes what everybody else thinks of him of little importance. The righteousness that comes from Christ on the basis of faith isn't just a commodity we possess. The righteousness that comes by faith in Christ means that we are possessed by Christ. And he lives in us and through us so that the righteousness that is his is lived out by his Holy Spirit in our lives. This is why we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And this is why we love our neighbor as ourself. And the beauty of this kind of righteousness is it doesn't produce pride. It doesn't produce arrogance. It doesn't produce self-centeredness because it's always turned away from us and focused on the Christ. This righteousness that Jesus says we must have that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees isn't about quantity, it's about quality. Isn't about quantity, it's about quality. And the only where, the only place that you can find the quality of righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees is found in Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you this morning, what do you look like in your spirit, in your inner person? Do you look like a Pharisee, pride, arrogance, self-centeredness? Oh, I'm not saying you're not religious. 
I'm not saying on the outside you don't look nice, but is there an unloving spirit, a criticalness in you, a dislike for others? Then I urge you to turn to the only Savior there is, a Savior who can deliver you from your righteousness and give you the righteousness that will cause the gates of heaven to be open to you, that the kingdom of heaven will be yours and you can sit down with Jesus Christ at the table and he will say to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's so easy to be a Pharisee. That's why Jesus was so hard on him because he's talking to each one of us. Would you help us to drop this years of self-effort righteousness and embrace Christ's righteousness? Would you free us from looking at the law as, as little as I can get away with and help us see it as a signpost that points us to the perfect righteousness of Christ? Do this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you live this kind of righteousness, it results in God getting the glory. And so we sing to God be the glory. And as you sing, use it as a hymn and a prayer that turns you away from your own righteousness and causes you to look at the righteousness of Christ. Hymn number 55, to God be the glory. Thank you so much. What a, what a great hymn. And I uh, just, again, want to thank everyone who's made this service possible. We're getting more and more technical and uh, intricate in this process. And so, Sam, thank you for the extra work you're putting in. Scott worked very hard to put that prelude together, and we're grateful for him doing that. Emma is, uh, after a long week of hard work, is willing to sing for us. And so that's great. Christy, for reading. Dave, thank you for coming and and leading us in worship. And thank you for live streaming us. And I, I hope that uh, you're feeling connected and close to people in the church. Reach out to somebody, have someone over for coffee out on the patio, socially distance. Uh, just 
uh, to spend some time together, spend some time with your Lord. Receive his benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all. Amen.